Hello, I'm Mark Abbott, pastor of Community United Methodist Church. I'm so glad you can join us today. Today we're going to talk about be true to who you are. The scripture passage for today is the epistle of 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 13 through 25. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Therefore prepare your minds for action and discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke his Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world, but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. Now that you have purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, so that you have genuine mutual love, love one another deeply from the heart. You have been born anew, not of perishable, but of imperishable seed, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. That word is the good news that was announced to you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I would like us to have an opportunity to pray together, so would you join with me in prayer? Joyful, joyful, we adore you, God of glory, Lord of love. Our hearts unfold like flowers before you, opening to your light. We rejoice in you, Creator God, and in your marvelous, beautiful creation. Your creative vision and purpose are as great as the universe and as delicate as a flower. O oh God, as we praise you for your wondrous creation, we are reminded that beauty and unending variety are part of who you are. Your vision for us is beautiful, and you delight in making each of us different. May we celebrate our difference and the beauty in each one, even as we acknowledge you are the one who binds us together in perfect unity. O oh God, there is much in our world that is not beautiful. Sinful humanity attempts to replace your vision of beauty with its own parody. We have strife, conflicts, and war. We have shameful levels of economic and social inequality. Even in the midst of a pandemic, some seek advantage over others. We need you, O oh God. We need your kingdom to take root and your vision for our world to be our vision. We offer ourselves as followers of Jesus Christ and citizens of heaven to be your instruments of healing, peacemaking, and reconciliation. May we be a testimony to your vision for humanity. Help us to be bridges in the midst of a highly polarized society. And now we join our sisters and brothers around the world as we pray the prayer Jesus taught, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. True to who you are. I grew up in the panhandle of West Texas, which is Northwest Texas, on the high plains. 
I was born in Lubbock, which is the home of Texas Tech University. My father was a Methodist pastor, so we moved around a good bit. In fact, before I left home for college, I only lived for four years in one town. Usually it was two to three years. This is why I really don't have a special attachment to a specific town uh, for my growing up years. The only city that I, grew, I was in was in Amarillo for three years, and that may not seem large to you, but it seems certainly large to us. So most of my growing up was in small towns. My mother was a housewife and mother whose life basically consisted of children, supporting my dad, and of course, church. Both of my parents grew up on farms, and fortunately, I knew all four of my grandparents, and I just loved visiting the farms. Now, why am I mentioning this stuff about my growing up? Well, if you want to get to know someone, you really have to know the context in which they grew up, in which they came into their own sense of person. Our identity and values are constructs. They are built piece by piece and formed by a whole myriad of details from our context and our early experiences and the people most close to us, the people who are most formative in our lives. We are uh, who we are was shaped by people, places, and experiences, and all of them in particular contexts. My life took a different turn when I went away to college, over 500 miles away from my parents. Actually, since the day I left for college, I did not live with my parents again in their home, except for the summer after I graduated college, just before I went to seminary because I would spend the summers working somewhere away from home rather than living at home. When we leave home, we have a chance to become independent. We're forced to make our own decisions. And uh, here's the exciting and the scary part. We can begin to choose to change our values and our sense of identity. We can actually begin to become different than the way we were formed and raised. This may be for good or for ill, but at any rate, we have a choice and we begin to make choices that change us. Some of those changes may be very small. Some of the changes may be very radical. I know some pastors whose children are atheists. They basically rejected the values and the faith that they were raised with. And although as a Christian that hurts me, it, is so, it emphasizes the truth that our identity and our values are not frozen in place. Our identity and our values are actually changeable. Let's listen to what 1 Peter says about our identity. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope. We saw this verse last week, didn't we? God has given us a new birth. Do you realize that that means the new birth means that you have a new identity in Jesus Christ? Our passage today says that we were born of an imperishable seed, an eternal seed. We have divine DNA. This is why we call God our Father. It's the source of who we are. He's the one responsible for the new birth in the Spirit. We are God's children and we have a glorious inheritance. So with our new birth, we have a new identity and a new inheritance. All of these things I mentioned about my growing up that serve as reference point upon which my identity really is constructed and which formed the values in me, those th and as well as the changes that I made after leaving home, cease being the fundamental anchor points of my identity in the light of the new birth. God becomes the source of my identity. God becomes the fundamental anchor point for my values and my sense of what is right and wrong and true. This is why 1 Peter refers to the people in, the, in his letter saying you are aliens and exiles. Why aliens and exiles? He's not talking primarily about geography that they're living somewhere where they were not born and raised, 
although that probably was true for many of them. He is talking about that how their identity in Christ supersedes their identity that they were born with and shaped with. Our Christ identity supersedes their world-constructed identity. They are citizens of heaven living with a foreign passport in this world. Do you ever think of yourself as a citizen of heaven with a foreign passport living in this world? As one who's lived in two other countries besides my country of origin, I know what it's like to live with a foreign passport and to not be the native. <clears throat> the whole point of our passage today is to exhort us to be true to our new identity in Jesus Christ. If we are born of the new, born of the Spirit, God is the reference point for our identity and is the standard for our values. That's why Peter is getting, this is what Peter is getting at when he says, As he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. If God is holy, if we are born of God's seed, of the imperishable seed, born of the Spirit, then holiness is natural to us. It's a part of who we are. As children of God, we are set apart from the world's system of values and from the world's standards for evaluating things of what is good and bad, what is preferable and not preferable. God sets is our reference point, and God sets the standards. But we are not set apart, just set apart from the world. We are not withdrawn behind walls inside a castle. We are also set apart for God. This is the positive side of holiness. The negative side, you may be upset apart from certain things, but you're also set apart for things. This doesn't mean that we are so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. God, remember, is love. And God is engaging in a mission of reaching out to people who are separated from him and who are lost in their sins. God is engaged in a mission of restoring and healing humanity and reconciling core relationships. So as a holy people that are set apart for God, people of the new birth, we are filled with God's love and we share in God's mission. We go about doing what God is doing and wants to do in the world. So holiness is an, a proactive, positive approach to living. It's not a reclusive, exclusive, behind the walls, holier than thou, don't contaminate me with your sin kind of approach to life. It is a mission-driven, love-energized approach to life. And it's based on our identity as children of God. Because God is holy, we are holy. So as God's children, God is the reference point for our identity and values, and God sets the standards. Our passage again says, If you invoke as Father the one who judges all people, wow, the ultimate judge of everyone, if you invoke as Father the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile, that is, during this life. We acknowledge that Almighty God, whom we call our Heavenly Father, is the ultimate judge of all things. This means that God sets the standards for that judgment. God is the standard because God is the creator, and we are made in the divine image. Nothing outside of God has ultimate standard for judgment. But this immediately sets up a contrast and a conflict with the world's standards and values. The criteria that the world uses are other people, society, the laws that governments may take, and these change from time to time. My wife and I were watching a television program from the 90s, and the way they were talking about certain subjects would be considered very in, politically incorrect today. The standards of the world, the way they evaluate and understand and view things, changes. But God is the one who sets the standards and is the ultimate judge. God establishes the criteria. So we live our lives, Paul, Peter says, in reverent fear 
not in terror, in dread, or anything like that, but fear that is by binding our lives to God's standards and by being true to our relationship with God. Listen to the way that Peter contrasts our identity as newborn people, as children of God, with our identity prior to the new birth. Do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. He reforms to, refers to their former life, in this case, as Gentiles, who were not followers of Jesus Christ, as uh, a life according to the world's standards is a time of living in ignorance. Of course, the world's standards thinks it's offering all of the wisdom and knowledge there is, but God is the one, and again, the source of wisdom and knowledge, and ultimately, truth is grounded in who God is. So a, a life outside of God is a life in ignorance. He also says, you were ransomed, that is, bought, redeemed, saved, from the feudal or empty ways inherited from your ancestors. The reference point for identity and values prior to the new birth, he calls feudal or empty. The contrast between the life anchored in God and the one based on the world system is very clear. The world system is a system based on appearance and image. That's so much so in our video media age, isn't it? But the other is based upon substance, because God is the actual substance. One is a value system based on what others think. And whatever the, the mood of the time or the times that may be, those are the values. But our values are grounded in God. The rewards offered by the world can be very attractive. Everything from wealth and power, celebrity, anything most people would dream of, right? But the reward systems are temporary and fleeting, and sometimes those things that we portray as so wonderful, those who are actually living some of those find them quite empty. But the rewards we have is this incredible inheritance being kept for us by the power of God in heaven. And this inheritance, we will come into that when Jesus Christ is revealed someday. So our new birth identity is grounded in the God who made us, the God who is love. You know, in this passage, the Apostle Peter has really put his finger on the reason that we as Christians often feel conflicted. The new birth gives us a new identity with new reference points. God is our holy, heavenly Father. We're born of imperishable seed. Our inheritance is, that of, in our, is based on our true identity as God's children. So we should not be surprised that we are criticized or we feel out of step with the world by people who don't understand or criticize us for not going along with the world's standards and its values, by not just going along with the flow of the world. We must follow Peter's advice. He says, prepare your minds for action. We have to go through a whole rethinking and re-education process based on our new identity in Jesus Christ. This is where the scriptures are so important to our formation as new people. He says, discipline yourselves. We have to uh, take some things out of our lives that were a part of our life before Christ, but we also need to build spiritual practices and other things into our lives and habits of giving and loving and patience and humility and so many other things. Be disciplined yourselves. Be holy in your conduct. This isn't a sanctimonious, holier than thou, I'm better than you are approach to the way we deal with people. It just means that our lives are to reflect the, the, who, the, and our character, the character of our God, who is our Heavenly Father. And then he says, set your hope on the gracious inheritance that Christ is bringing, our ultimate salvation. So quite simply, the God's word to us today is to exhort us to be faithful to who we truly and genuinely are in Jesus Christ. Be true to who you are. Let us pray together. Oh God, we want to thank you for the gift of the new birth in Jesus Christ and for the gift of the Holy Spirit so that your presence comes to live within us. But even as you are holy, 
We are to be holy, God, not just as an attempt in our behavior. We are to be holy because that is who we truly are. God, I pray that you would help each person listening to this today to have a deep sense of their identity rooted in Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help us to make the commitment to be true to who you made us to be, to be holy in our conduct, to begin the re-education and renewal process of our minds and the renewal of our minds, that you would help us to be disciplined in what we exclude from our lives and disciplined about what we positively begin to incorporate into our lives as your children. And God, I pray that we would be so intoxicated with your love that we would join you in your mission of healing and restoring people and bring, being peacemakers and being helping people to be reconciled in their relationships. Oh God, we thank you for the gift of who we are. There is innumerable variety and difference, and yet our oneness comes from you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Now I would like to offer you a blessing and benediction. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in Christ's peace.